Uh, I'd like to kindly introduce Deputy Director for SOCOM, focused on acquisition, technology, and logistics, Mr. Bill Innes. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Um, good afternoon again. I uh, think this is where I make a joke about starting right after lunch. Um, that was it, actually, so I don't actually have one. Um, I am Bill Ennis. I'm the Deputy Director of Special Operations Forces Acquisition Technology and Logistics. I'll take a, talk a little bit about what that, that means from a, an authority's perspective, but uh, my focus will be on the, on the capabilities themselves supported by technology. Uh, that are important to our Special Operations Forces operators, which is why we in South ATNL exist. Uh, and I'll wrap up with a few thoughts on the uh, threats and, and challenges we're, we're wrestling with in, in South ATNL every day. Uh, I'll be hitting the tech pretty high level uh, and looking forward to hearing the experts um, discuss in more detail how tech, AI, ML, quantum data, for example, in particular, uh, can help fill, fill in any gaps and, and challenges we see and how we, how we better access it. Um, so on the next slide, point anywhere probably, huh? There we go. Uh, real quick agenda. I'm going to start with a, a video, and uh, again, I'll start with our authorities, how we're structured as a bit of a baseline in SOF ATNL, then talk about our processes, the technology focus areas that we have in, in the command, and key capabilities and programs associated with those tech focus areas. Uh, made a few changes uh, to the rollout, so it doesn't follow exactly that, but, uh, but close enough. Uh, and I may bring up a few points as I go through this. I've kind of taken some notes through the per first half of the discussion. I really like that, that early part of the discussion. Obviously, uh, acquisition and how fast we move is always a, always a challenge, and what our requirements are in, in legacy programs and moving on to the next generation is always tough in DOD acquisition. I think we're pretty good at it in SOCOM. Um, I've done acquisition in a number of places, Air Force, Navy, even a little time with the Army. So uh, I've, I've really enjoyed being in SOF 18 now, so I do think we do it better there than, than anywhere else. Um, so. I'm going to start with a video. It is about uh, six minutes. You should see a few things that I'll come back to in the next few slides. Uh, it's really just one maritime-focused vignette. Uh, we, could, we do a number of these, and we could do any number of them, but I think it's pretty good kind of for this forum to, to highlight some of those areas that uh, you know, will drive this discussion, some of the tech areas we're focused on. So about six minutes. The 2018 National Defense Strategy articulates that the U.S. military will face increased global disorder, characterized by decline in the longstanding rules-based international order, creating a security environment more complex and volatile than any experienced in recent memory. The reemergence of long-term strategic competition, rapid dispersion of technologies, and new concepts of warfare and competition that spans the entire spectrum of conflict requires a joint force to meet the challenges of this reality. Adversaries' anti-access area denial, A2AD, capabilities aim to create a broad area maritime surveillance capability, targeting system, and contested comms environment, CCE, that in time of conflict would render the existing naval and joint platform architecture increasingly vulnerable. Recognizing the increasingly complex security environment, the AI for Maritime Maneuver Futures concept was designed to employ AI, edge compute, specialized communications, and robotic autonomy in maritime soft man-unmanned teams in a highly unique manner to tip the balance of power in multi-domain A2 AD competition space to our advantage, today and into the future. Artificial intelligence for maritime maneuver addresses those key problems faced in the future operating environment to gain, maintain, and extend access into the adversary's competition space while enabling the joint force's decision advantage and the application of scalable effects with enhanced precision. Hallmarks of the AIM concept. AI-enabled soft maritime craft and seasoned operators, self, deception, mass, and precision are intended to penetrate the adversary's defenses, complicate enemy kill chains, and ensure own force lethality and survivability. Future success will increasingly go to the actor who can best gather data, process it into actionable information, and team with partners, both human and machine, in real time. Maritime SOF, with specialized low observable craft and focused applications of AI and autonomy, teamed with multi-domain unmanned systems, can extend its access, swarming from the sea, through the littoral commons and inland, to directly enable scalable and mass effects, on scene, but unseen. 
The AIM concept takes advantage of cutting edge usage of onboard compute, data, artificial intelligence, and specialized communications or AI enabled mission autonomy in small UXS to deploy within range of adversary targets, enabling AI autonomous systems to detect, classify, and identify AIM points to provide enhanced precision of targeting to fire's platforms, enabling a clear decision advantage. Critical to the success of these missions is all domain awareness, alternative PNT, mission autonomy, and tactical intelligence at the edge and specialized communications on demand while ensuring mission command deliberately and discreetly networked to the joint force. Given their low observable small size, mission autonomy and tactical intelligence at the edge, AI-enabled robotic systems and maritime soft man-unmanned teams are uniquely positioned to excel in their ability to gain, maintain, and extend access into highly contested environments. An on, above, and under maritime soft sea strike portfolio of access, mass, and precision could provide the joint force with a broader spectrum of unique options to create more complex dilemmas for defeating adversaries. AIM expands the maritime strike warfare's ability to achieve kinetic effects on a broader variety of targets that might have otherwise been inaccessible. AIM promises to shrink the competition bubble in highly contested A2AD environments by employing AI-enabled maritime soft man-unmanned teams operating far forward in contested environments to deliver kinetic and non-kinetic effects, including unprecedented access to sub-T and mobile launch sites, ultimately removing cover and concealment from our opponents while providing targeting quality data to the joint force. AI for automated target detection, tracking, cross-queuing, and command and control will further expand the ways in which the maritime soft man-unmanned team can enable joint warfare with speed, precision, and massed efficiency to support the effects kill chain. The artificial intelligence for maritime maneuver futures concept leverages maritime soft capabilities envisioned to operate in new and unique ways when empowered by AI and autonomous systems to operate in maritime soft man-unmanned teams to solve critical operational problems of the future operating environment. The AI-enabled Maritime Soft man unmanned team provides a collection of unique, scalable capabilities that will enable the joint force to compete and win in complex, contested, and denied environments across the competition continuum. This is what the nation expects from special operations. Okay, that is a, a conceptual vid video, if you will, but a lot of it is uh, in, in reality in terms of what we're going after today and what we're moving uh, moving dollars to. Uh, we're having a conversation over lunch. You can follow the dollars, you know, show me your dollars, and I can show you your strategy. And we're definitely moving a lot of dollars uh, in, into that space. Um, okay, so organizationally, uh, I did want to start start off with this. A lot of folks in the room probably know all about this, um, but um, you know. Um, I want to establish the foundation uh, to capture where we as an acquisition fit in the, in the overall uh, organization. Uh, so founded in 1987 out of the failed Iran hostage rescue operation, almost everybody in here knows that. Uh, Congress forced the DOD to establish a joint command to ensure not, we had not only the best individual service operators, but the best cross-service team. Uh, and that wasn't just in the operation side, but also in the acquisition support side of it as well. They wanted us to have a, the acquisition authority to get after our joint needs. Um, there are two sides of SOCOM, makes it unique in DOD. Uh, Ms. Logan uh, talked about it earlier in terms of uh, the two sides of SOCOM. On one side, the, uh, the left side here, your left side, is the operational side. Uh, and then on the right side is the organized, train, and equip side, uh, the component commands, AFSOC, USASOC, WARCOM, MARSOC. Uh, closely aligned to that right side, um, but showing here down the middle is the acquisition authority, and that's what we in SOF ATNL execute. Uh, by law, we are responsible to the commander, General Fenton, with advocacy from ASD Solik, uh, to deliver soft peculiar equipment and services to soft operators with congressionally appropriated dollars. So that's really important, of course. Uh, we do that in close collaboration with the components, with the operators, with the big services, but primarily through, through contracts uh, with the defense industrial base. So if soft operators need a new capability, it's soft ATNL's responsibility and legal authority to provide it. So again, just a little bit of a baseline. And this is what the uh, this is who executes that authority organizationally. 
Mr. Smith at the bottom there is the acquisition executive. Uh, the second and third rows are the program executive officers who deliver the capability in their domain areas, supported by the top row, most importantly, um, Ms. Lisa Sanders in the science and technology shop. Uh, her work, which includes close collaboration with labs, academia, industry, finds and helps integrate technology, our PEOs, and ultimately our operators, uh, finds and helps integrate our, the technology, our PEOs, and, and ultimately the operators need. Uh, PEOs work on tech too, but that really is Lisa's 100% focus. Uh, it's akin to the separate, or now separate, acquisition and sustainment shops at the OSD level, led by Dr. LaPlante, and the research and engineering shop, led by uh, Ms. Heidi Shu. Uh, but again, we're still under one roof at SOCOM, to, to our benefit, I, I think. Um, I wanted to highlight as well some of the uh, specific areas that, that are focused on uh, in this conversation, I think, is PEO soft digital applications, you know, strictly focused on soft applications, software applications. Uh, we just stood that one up recently. PEO special reconnaissance in the middle there. PEO in the upper left, uh, command control, communications, and computers. All important, of course. PEO Maritime, Randy Slaff, they work very closely together. It's one of the challenges, I think, as, uh, as you know, integration changes, I guess, and becomes more important is tying all the PEOs together. But I think we do that a pretty good job uh, at SOCOM. Um, <clears throat> I also want to point out Master Chief Steve White in the, in the bottom left there. He is our uh, Navy SEAL senior enlisted leader. Uh, really important to have that operator in the loop um, and, uh, you know, make sure we maintain our, our North Star there. That's who we're here, here to support. Um, and just to the conversation of the size, this is about 900 people, and that's 900 of the 6,000 that was mentioned earlier. So uh, acquisition is, is unique in that regard, like CENTCOM and, and the joint staff, they don't have an acquisition shop. So this is a big, a big piece of that. I'll tell you that, you know, we have, we've done a lot, of, a lot of data runs on that, and, uh, you know, the experience that I have, I'll, I'll tell you, we need more people. <laughs> I, I know it was brought up earlier, but, uh, you know, in terms of the complexity and the size of the, of the, of the contracts that we're, awarding, that we're working on, we haven't changed that much in the last 10 years, but our RDT&E and procurement dollars have gone up, and uh, it is one of the things that I, I lose sleep over is, is our workforce. Our work-life balance there is a real challenge, and we're in a war for talent, so it's something we're constantly working on. Um, or we need a heck of a lot less bureaucracy to, to the point I think that was made. Um, and I think that is increasing as well. But uh, this is the group that, that, that delivers the capability. Okay. Uh, high level, tech, uh, tech pathway process. The endpoint really is the block of programs of record on the, on the right here. Um, that, that's really the, the capability delivery. Um, and um, we're really... You know, part of that, the platforms and services, which is on my last slide, is, you know, I'll kind of sum up. But up front, I wanted to provide an overview of how we drive tech into those capabilities. Uh, we don't buy tech for tech's sake. We buy capabilities, and uh, the tech help us, helps us meet those capabilities. Uh, someone may challenge me on that, but it was brought up last night, you know, tech in terms of like AI. Hey, let's just sprinkle some AI on that, you know. We're still after the capability, and what can tech do to help us um, to deliver those capabilities? Um, and maybe that's something we need to talk about more at, at a higher level. Again, the discussion that we had earlier about, uh, you know, where SOF is moving in terms of 130s and, and drones, you know, MQ1s, MQ9s, you know, what is next generation? Um, you know, what is the capability we really need? Um, the slide is probably an oversimplification. It's generally not linear, but overall it starts with the top-down direction from General Fenton and uh, Secretary Mary and the guidance documents, all fed by the National Defense Strategy up at, up at the top. Um, and uh, our focus is on the circle, which I'll highlight, you know, and, you know provides us with those th uh, six technology focus areas, which I'll highlight in the next, uh, next slide in more detail. Uh, but it's also bottoms up with inputs from the operator in the field. Again, critically important to us. It's who we support. Not only do they feed us inputs from our data calls and cross components of S&T councils, but if they see something commercial tech that they like, or maybe uh, more relevant today in, in, in this forum, uh, something a foreign partner has. Uh, you know, we just came from the Ukraine uh, discussion roundtable there, and you know, some of the things they're doing overseas. We need to do a better job of adapting that, adopting that, and the, the, the lessons that they're learning over there are enormous. So we need to stay close to our operators who are seeing that on the, on the front line. Um, they have authority, but if the operators see that, they have the authority to try it out, and if it's useful, we'll fold it into one of those programs of record and get it to the whole force uh, with uh, congressional appropriations, of course. Given those focus areas, Lisa Sanders and her S&T shop, as well as the PEOs, uh, execute strategic, strategic engagements like this one, uh, futures efforts resulting in the conceptual video that I showed earlier uh, to drive thinking on operational concepts and gaps, and experimentation where we bring in our partners to demonstrate current or nascent tech to see how it might meet our capability in an operational environment. Uh, we have two of those coming up this year, actually, in contested comms and next generation ISR. So that's kind of the cycle. That, that's the tech that 
tech analysis, uh, uh, S&T type work that feeds uh, everything in the upper right in terms of the, uh, the programs that we execute. So these uh, tech focus areas, breaking them down a little bit further uh, with a couple of quick examples. Uh, we're interested in, in biotech, uh, such as repeated, repeated blast exposure impacts to operators, next generation ISR, I mentioned that a few times, including space and cyber. It's not just about the drones these days, although that still is important. Uh, network and data management, sensor fusion, hyper-enabled operator, uh, optical character recognition, natural language processing, um, information dominance, if you will, is a big part of that. Next generation precision strike, late loiter, loitering munitions is uh, popular these days, so to speak, and uh, next generation mobility, including expeditionary logistics, which is a, which is a big deal. Um, Acknowledging these are fairly broad and there is some overlap, I'd suggest uh, AI, ML, data, computing uh, enhance all of them. It does give us some uh, guidance and boundaries with limited resources, and I think you saw a number of those, uh, if not all, in, in, in that video. Um, especially how all the sensors and associated comms and data would be linked together to hyper-enable our operators on mobility platforms employing various uh, effects. And what do those uh, capability platforms look like? Uh, Here's a high-level overview, not all-inclusive. We like to say we deliver everything from satellites to submarines, uh, which is true. Uh, the slide's broken down by domain capability areas, including the ground, air, and maritime for, for, for portfolios on the left. Um, I did, uh, Colonel, I wanted to <laughs> dig into the, not dig into it, but I'm going to check my numbers. I worked on the F-22 program uh, back in 2004, 5, and 6, and I'm pretty sure that was more expensive than the AC-130J, so that you what got my the F-22. 165 according to Wiki, which is never wrong. It was over. It was over. Well, 2006 dollars, it was over 200 million, and there was always a gimmick that they pulled where they didn't include the engines. So, um, but uh, anyway, I, I, will, uh, I will look that up. But it got my attention having worked on F-22 when we went to full rate production. Anyway, um, as I noted, you'll see some of the things from uh, the video already in our formations. Uh, the, the combatant craft, the undersea craft, drones. Uh, precision strike munitions, um, but very clearly why I think we have gaps is in the last three rows in comms and data particularly. And that's interesting because uh, the department is still fairly decent, I think, at delivering purely uh, defense-related um, capabilities, uh, some of the hardware uh, defense-related capabilities, although it probably does cost too much and take too long. I think uh, we'd all probably agree with that. But we still kind of lead, lead the league, so, so to speak, in that. Uh, but we primarily lag in, in, um, when it comes to areas that are now driven by the commercial sector. Uh, so 40 years ago, I think we led in all of these areas, but now we're just desperately trying to keep up. Again, comms, data, our, uh, networks, uh, and software in particular. Uh, we have the hardware in a lot of ways, but fusing all that data together in high bandwidth network, uh, networks operating in congested and congested environments, using AI ML tools and high-powered compute, may be disconnected from the broader network to process the data and feed the operators to make, make the right decisions at speed in not only kinetic strike scenarios, but sentiment analysis and information operations, information dominance. Uh, and all of that put together, you know, that's the crux of the challenge that, that we're facing. Okay, last slide. And these are really uh, my questions um, and uh, final thoughts and a twist, you know, these are the questions I'm presenting to the group and it's really the things that we wrestle with, with every day at, at SOF ATML. Uh, I'd be interested in kind of the panel's thoughts on this. Final thoughts to consider, particularly related to the threats and challenges uh, inherent in these key technologies that support our operators, uh, support our capabilities. Um, first is security. Cybersecurity, working with uh, non-traditional DOD commercial providers in a classified environment. Higher levels of encryption required for military products. We can't just give our operators iPhones, at least I don't think that we can. The viability of our encryption tools in the face of quantum-powered threats. Supply chains, not just robust supply chains, but trusted supply chains. Uh, all of these security concerns are in balance with the ever-increasing need for interoperability and integration with allies and partners, which we've talked a lot about here today. And that's key to the SOCOM mission, always has and always will be, I think. It's almost a perfect contradiction, locking our capabilities down, but exporting them to or integrating with uh, partners and allies. Uh, second is how do we keep pace with or even get ahead of industry? I've read uh, estimates that DOD is less than 1% of the integrated circuit market, and SOCOM is 2% of, of the DOD budget higher, if you include the services, 3%, 4%, somewhere in there, I think. Uh, are there paths to influence to meet our, our needs, our security needs, our defense-related uses? Do we need different business and financial arrangements with willing partners? Congress has uh, improved acquisition, I think, and our ability to keep up with the commercial sector with OTAs and MTAs. You hear these, these acronyms about contracting approaches and acquisition approaches, and that's helped. 
but I do think we need to do better. It's, it's not enough because con uh, the threats and the technology in the commercial sector is changing so fast. And third is what risk are we willing to take with the AI ML driven tools and how we use them. There's probably a little risk in using these tools for sentiment analysis. We talked a little bit about hostile, in hostile environments or maintaining our aircraft. We kind of talked about that, for example. But how far off are we from really using AI ML tools to help us make kinetic decisions or information uh, operations decisions or uh, electromagnetic dominance decisions? Uh, how far off are we from, from using that? And is our risk, risk calculus that different than our competitors and enemies? Almost, almost certainly, I think the answer is yes there. Um, so um, that's how I'll wrap it up. I'm about to get the hook, actually. Um, uh, rather abruptly, I guess, but I'll turn it over to the panel. This is what we in SOF 18L do. These, we kind of did a quick run through of our technology focus areas, and what I see is the challenges and threats against us. Uh, against us. But that's what we do, uh, make sure that our operators have far more capability, which requires the best technology uh, than the enemy. So thank you. And I don't know if I have time for questions. Maybe I did that. You know, when drones first sort of uh, arrived on the scene, the U.S. Air Force was always very keen to sort of say, you know, there's always going to be a human in the loop. And when I was watching the video, I mean, will that that you played, um, where will a human be in that in that loop, given all these unmanned AI-driven? Yeah, I, I don't know for sure that I have the, the, the answer to that, like physically where that individual will be, whether it's the operator on the combatant craft that you saw or, um, you know, at the, uh, at the operational command level, um, at, you know, using our mission command platform, which we're building under PEO SDA. So it's probably a combination of both. I guess to clarify, when <clears throat> there will always be a human in the loop when the decision is made to kill somebody, was the sort of operating idea that the U.S. Air Force had. Is that basically like we're just completely past that point and it's not even worth a discussion or? At the, at today, I think it is. I think we're past that point. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Do you agree with that or you don't agree with that? <laughs> I'm, I, I don't know enough, but it just it seems that we are in a situation where the, these machines will simply be fighting each other and the humans will be almost entirely absent. I, I personally think we're a long way off from that, but I uh, um, understand your comment, of course. Yes, ma'am. For those really cool systems that you showed in the initial video, um, how important will it be to have, if we're thinking about the Indo-Pacific, um, access to bases or places with allies and partners to do maintenance or resupply of some of those platforms? Um, yeah, good question. Depending on how they are being used and depending on the scenario, I guess, I'm getting a little out of my lane there, but, uh, um, you know, as it stands now, uh, it, it's not critically important, but uh, if we have no, you know, access over there, it would be a pretty big problem, uh, is the short answer. Does that, that make sense? A really vague kind of answer to your question, though, I'm afraid. Yes, sir. Hey, Bill, what, what are your top five ongoing program acquisitions? Um, in terms of dollars or importance, I'll say dollars. in terms. Oh, in terms of dollars. Um, I want to answer that with our priority programs, um, and it would be like our mission command, which I mentioned earlier, a common operating picture. It would be counter UAS is really important to us. Uh, Armed Overwatch, you mentioned, it is one of our important programs. And uh, you know, I'm the acquisition guy. I get the requirement and the money, and I go execute. Uh, but in the counterterrorism fight, which we still have to maintain, we do believe that is an affordable, effective way to provide that Armed Overwatch so the bigger force can go do their big thing against the great power competition. Um, what's the next one? Undersea portfolio is really important. Dry combat submersibles, the DCSs. Um, and uh, let me think about next one, probably. Um, and that's four that pop into my head. Um, yeah. Data is huge. Data is absolutely huge to us. You know, and I did mention, you know, in the video they called it AIMM, but uh, um, we are working, uh, you know, it's not that same acronym, but like I said, in the next few years we're definitely advancing the amount of money we're spending on that very concept. So that's a really important program to us in the maritime portfolio. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, how tied in is SOCOM with the venture capital community when you're looking to find some of these solutions for the requirements that we have? 
Not as close as we would like to be, but we are putting a lot of effort into that. Um, absolutely putting a lot of effort into that. And it's an important, uh, <clears throat> it's something that General Fenton, our commander, of course, is pushing for, actually. Um, he's had a few sessions with uh, some of the venture capital folks that are interested in doing business with us uh, down at the headquarters. And our, our Softworks platform, if you've heard of that, that's our partnership intermediary agreement that does a lot of outreach for us. They're a neutral non nonprofit that, that helps us with outreach with small businesses. They're also holding regular events now. As a matter of fact, it's ongoing where they're going to do the next iteration of tying venture capital companies that want to do business with, with DOD and want to invest in you know, these types of companies with the small businesses with our requirements, talking a lot about what I just showed up here today. So it's definitely a growth area. Not where we want to be yet, but we're pushing hard on that. It gets a little bit to what I said. I think we need to do better in terms of our business arrangements and financial arrangements. If we can you know, tighten that up, I think that's going to be really good for, for what we do. Please join me in thanking Deputy Director Ennis.